Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. The Lord is good. All the time, God is good. We are so glad to be with you. Uh, welcome to New Life Community Church in Brookfield. I'm Pastor Rick Tatina, and we're so excited to uh, be worshiping on the Lord's Day. All across the world, people are worshiping um, Jesus Christ. And so if that's why you're here, then you're in the right place. If you would, please just prepare your hearts as we enter God's throne of grace with confidence through the blood of Jesus Christ and with courage. If you would, let me read a scripture for us as we get ready to worship our King. My soul waits in silence for God alone. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, and I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will people assail me that you may take me out, all of you, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence? They have counseled only to thrust me down from my high position. They delight in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. My soul, wait in silence for God alone, for my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rest, the rock of my salvation and my refuge. Trust in Him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before Him, for He is a refuge for us. Once God has spoken, and twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God, and loving kindness is yours, O oh Lord, forever. Father, we thank you for this day. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We worship you, God, because you are good to us, because you have given us salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, who, while we were yet sinners, died for us, who brought us from being children of darkness to being children of light, who gives us eternal life, that all that have been given to the Son, Jesus Christ, will not perish and you will not lose any of us. We rejoice today, God, because you are almighty, because you are benevolent and loving towards us, because you care for us, Father, because you deliver us from the darkness, because you give us eternal life, because you are our friend, because you are good and holy, because you are immortal and invisible, because you are just and you are our coming King. We worship you today in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. Please stand with us and worship Jesus. Amen, amen. I want to welcome every one of you. Those of you guys that are watching online, we welcome you in this morning as well. And we just ask that you guys sing, clap your hands, just praise the living King, for he is worthy. Amen.
this morning that your glory your glory just come and fill this place your glory glory just come and fill our hearts that your glory may come and touch every single heart lord we praise you lord jesus we praise you in the good time and we praise you when things are not too good we just never never want to stop praising you lord jesus See 
looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high We see that our creation cry God we praise you We'll see you Break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise you Whoa, we praise you Whoa to do work in your life.
to do whatever you want to And I will make room for you, for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to, Jesus Sing it with me. Here is where I lay it down You are all I'm chasing this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where i lay it down you are all i'm chasing now this is my surrender this is my surrender Praise you, Jesus. Lift up a hand, clap to God if you would. Praise you, Lord. We thank you, God, for this brief moment where we cry out in song to you. So much of the Christian life is song. Let's sing a new song. Sing in our hearts. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to New Life Community Church in Brookfield. We're so glad you're here with us. Uh, if you don't mind, say hi to someone nearby. Give them, a, give them a wave. Give them a fist bump. Maybe even someone you, you've never met. Thank you to our worship team. Welcome to New Life Community Church. If you're new here, we're so glad you're here. We want to encourage you, if you're brand new, to take our three-try challenge, which is give us three tries on a Sunday and see if God doesn't speak to you, see if God doesn't uh, bless you, see if God hasn't touched you. Um, if he has already, then that's a sign that uh, he's working in your life. So please give us three tries on a Sunday. Uh, we've seen people take... The three try challenge and it's turned into 30 tries. Anybody on 30? 45? I'm still trying. I'm on like 9,302. So um, we do encourage you. Uh, we do have small groups. They will be starting up in September after Labor Day. But uh, one of the things we try to do is when you're new, you come into a church you try it out. You see if it's a place where you feel welcome, if it's a place where you feel like God is uh, speaking, and then you start to attend there, and then after a little while, you um, maybe you serve, or maybe you start to plug into a small group. And then after plugging into a small group, maybe there's a point where you're encouraged to invest financially in the church. And then after some time, there's a place where there's membership classes that you're welcome to be a member. So that's kind of the goal. Um, we want to we make it available to you to become a leader as well, a small group leader, a servant leader, um, someone who's just uh, leading others down the path of discipleship. And so that's kind of what we are. New Life is a church that meets in 27 locations. Uh, we do have a, a location in Havana, Cuba, and I don't remember if I mentioned, but um, two weeks ago we took up an offering for them and we raised $840. So thank you all. Thank you all for that. There were about six or seven other New Life locations that, are, that raised uh, offering for H New Life Havana, Cuba, who's going through some really challenging times. Um, so I'm sure the number's in the thousands. And so be encouraged that um, they are going to be blessed because they didn't, they didn't ask for this. This kind of started to come when um, some of the pastors started to talk about, can we even get money there? Can we get money there if we raise it? Because they don't have humanitarian aid there. They don't have World Vision. They don't have uh, Compassion International. They don't have any groups there 
to where you could send the funds. So we have some people that can bring it there. And so be encouraged um, that that's what we raised as a location. That was an amazing thing. Um, also, I do want to mention, um, I believe our Kid Zone is going to be going to the park today. So our Kid Zone leader, my beautiful wife on the right there, she's ready to take the kids. If you're four years old to ten years old, you're welcome to send your child. They're going to take them just two blocks. There's a fenced-in park, and they're going to have a devotional time, and they're going to have some ice water and chips. Um, if you'd like to go with your kid because you're, you're new, that's fine, too. You are uh, welcome to do that. Uh, we understand that it's, you know, I, I would do the same. So um, you're welcome to go there. They'll be back at the end of the service. And thank you to our kids' own leaders. Um, before we dismiss our teens, I believe we have a video to show our teens. Um, let's get that queued up. We want, we want you to know about something that, that is up and coming. And our teens group is called One Youth. And they don't spell that the way we used to, right? They don't use vowels anymore. It's O-N-E-Y-T-H. So our teens are too cool for some of the vowels, um, but let's see if we have that video available. Hello, New Life. My name is Sam Percaro, and I am the youth pastor at New Life Midway, and I am here to tell you about our dangerous youth retreat. This is our summer camp coming up August 13th through the 15th, and we are officially two weeks away from camp. We are so excited for what God is going to do in this week, but that means we only have one more week to sign up our kids. We have one more week. Registration closes August 8th at midnight, which is a Sunday. That is our last day to register kids. But here is a little bit of just information about the camp. The pricing per student is $119. That will cover their lodging, all their food. So the only cash that they will need to bring um, during those days is for the merch that we will be selling. But that is it, all the food, everything else will be covered. So that price covers all of that stuff. We have one of my best friends, Pastor Darrison, all the way from Miami coming up to preach. He is going to do an amazing job. He is, has more energy than me, and I just really believe he's going to be a blessing to, to our kids and your kids um, for that. As well, we have a lot of games planned. We have a lot of activities like dodgeball, tug of war, volleyball, water games, like crazy stuff like that. It's going to be an amazing time. So get your kids signed up. You can go to one youth. Dot com, 1YTH.com and get your kids signed up. It is going to be a blast. Hope to see your kids there. Hello, New Life. My name is Sam. That's Sam, if you don't know by now. So he got rid of the vowels. So O N E Y T H.com. Uh, you can sign up there. Um, anybody going to that? Anybody interested in that? Okay, that, that's probably kind of a new announcement. So sign up. If you have any questions or if you're interested, you know, our group leaders can, can take down your information as well. I believe there may be some scholarship funds toward that. So if you're someone who uh, would need a little assistance to get there, we wouldn't want you to miss it. And so please let your group leader know. Um, our teens are going to be meeting downstairs. So if you're uh, sixth grade through high school, you're welcome to, to go towards our teacher Gloria Lopez in the back. Um, she is an amazing lady, if you don't know her. Yeah. Her husband agrees. Um, and you will be, they'll be doing some teaching time down there. Just so you know, after the service today, if you are signed up for the LaGrange Road Outreach, um, you're welcome to just, you know, mingle a little bit and then make your way up here. We're just going to do a brief a uh, prayer and training for that, um, and if you didn't sign up, you're welcome to come today at um, after the service, after we do our little training, we're going to head over to LaGrange Road by the fountain, and just, we're going to pass out some ice waters, we're going to pass out some literature, and see if God doesn't kind of open up some doors for some conversations. We do have some New Life water bottles that we might give away, and so uh, we've been kind of praying for that, and if you're interested in that, please just come. Uh, if you're shy, if you're not sure about get passing out something to someone um, about Jesus Christ, that's okay. 
you can you can man the cooler, you can watch the water, you can you know be praying for those who are uh, just there. So we just want to kind of be there as a team, be there as a team, and and uh, engage our community with the gospel. So we're going to pray for that, and uh, we do want to encourage you. New Life Community Church exists because you have invested in this place, and so. If you have not um, already considered praying about investing finances in a local church, um, we'd encourage you to pray about that. Even pray about um, investing in New Life Brookfield. We have two ways that you can do that. One is online at newlifebrookfield.org, and the other is that we have some envelopes uh, in the back after the service. You're able to put a check or cash in there. And that money is tax deductible. The website is secure. It's simple. It's safe. It sends you a uh, authorization code every time you give, and so it will ask you to verify that gift. So let's pray for our offerings, and we will be there. Will be a short video, and then we'll be into our sermon. Father, thank you for this time. We bless, we bless our our children downstairs, the youth. We also pray for our kids' own children who are at the park enjoying the weather, God, and we do pray that you would speak to them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would plant seeds deep in them today, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would cause them to desire, to desire you. God, we pray that today as we hear from you in your word, that we would be people who are doers of your word, not just hearers, and we would be spreaders of your word as well. God, we thank you for these gifts and offerings. Bless those who give, Lord, and those who are um, unable to give. God, we pray that you would bless them. Father, we do pray for anyone in the church that is going through difficult times, that you would minister to them, that you would be close to them, and that you would be their strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the book of Revelation. Anybody scared? Scary couple chapters, huh? Dragons. We're going to see a beast today. 
It's all God's word, amen? We need to barrel through it. Kelvin Cochran, you've probably never heard that name. There's probably many more like him. He was a fire chief in Atlanta, Georgia, within the last 10 years. During his time as a fire chief, he was also an elder at his church, a Baptist church there in Atlanta, and he also wrote a Bible study for his church. In that, in that book, he talked about biblical morality. But after writing the book and after getting permission from his employer to put that he was the fire chief of Atlanta in the book, he was fired. Because in it, the book spoke about things that he believed, according to the word of God, that the mayor didn't agree with. The mayor said this, the sentiments in the book are hateful and judgmental. This book is not about religious freedom. This is not about free speech. This is about judgment. And he said he would not tolerate what the book put forth by one of his leaders. So Kelvin was fired. And even if the mayor were to say, as he, as he did, that it wasn't about religious freedom or religious beliefs, it was, wasn't it? Maybe you're here and you're someone who, you've seen stories like this. Someone at a school has been having a Bible study at the school for years. And then all of a sudden, the administration says, you can't have that here anymore. Some families have complained. And we're just going to have to ask you not to do that. Or maybe you've heard other stories where people used to pray at the flag at their university. And all of a sudden, there's a big controversy about if they can continue to do that. There's pressure out there. There's pressure out there because we live in a world where, as we saw last week, the dragon has been cast down, right? The dragon, the devil, has been cast out of heaven and he no longer has any accusations against us, but he's here on this earth for a short time. And he's trying to pressure believers to turn in their cards, to turn in their faith in Jesus Christ. So maybe you're here and you're someone who you felt the pressure to keep quiet about your faith in Jesus before. You were more vocal maybe a couple of years ago or maybe five, six years ago. You used to speak more boldly, but things have changed. And you're pressured to keep quiet, and you don't even know where that pressure, where that temptation's coming from. Maybe you're someone who you have friends that you used to share your faith with and one of your friends pushed back strongly against you and that caused you to, to hold it in, to silence it. Maybe you're someone who, like me, wonder, what would I do if I was faced with one of those really challenging situations? Losing my job? Or keeping my faith in Christ, keeping my testimony in Christ. Maybe you've wondered that. Would I be strong enough? Or maybe you're someone who 
You want to be bold. You want to be a bold witness for Jesus Christ in the face of the dragon who's raging. Well, let me tell you, you're in the right place. God's word is going to talk to us. God's word has chosen this topic for us today. And it is this. How to respond when you're pressured to abandon soul worship of God. How do I respond? What do I do when the authorities... When your boss, when the state, when the school, when the world wants you to abandon your allegiance to God. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. using the New American Standard Bible. Verses 1 and 2. Remember, we're talking about the Apostle John is seeing visions, multiple visions that he is going back to write down for us. And the Holy Spirit has led him to write them down for the churches. The churches of his day, the seven churches that we saw in the video. And there are things for us today as well. And then he says this, I saw the dragon, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were were ten diadems, ten crowns. On his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And its feet were like those of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Listen, when we engage this book, there are some challenges. There are interpretive challenges that face us, okay? But, but, it's not as complex as as we sometimes think, and some people, they check out. John Calvin, who wrote many commentaries on the New Testament, did not write one on this book. And pastors avoid this book, but they do so to their own detriment because this is a book for the churches. The beginning of the letter says, This is for the churches, the seven churches. And then at the end of the letter, it says, Behold, I've written this book in chapter 22, verse 16, for the churches. Some people put revelation all in the future. And there are future components to it. But it's a message to the churches, to people who are holding faithful to Jesus Christ, to give them hope, like it said in the video, to revive them who are struggling with being persecuted, and then those who have bought into the world system, who are living at ease, it's to wake them up. And so last, last week we saw that the dragon, the devil, was thrown down, thrown down from heaven. He can no longer say anything about any believer to God in heaven. He has no accusatory power anymore. But he's been cast here, and the whole world is under his deception, except for believers. So there's imagery. There's numbers. And sometimes people read too much into the imagery, and they don't let it do what it's supposed to do, which is to grab our attention. Grab our attention. So how do you respond? How does, the, how does the Word of God want us to respond when we're pressured to abandon God? 
Number one is this. By recognizing the temptation as a scheme from the devil. That's number one. You can write it down if you'd like. You need to recognize, the first thing to know is that when you're tempted and you've been careful, you're making a decision to do something that God wants you to do that's faithful to the Word of God, and you're tempted to hold back, to pull that back, to retract that. That's likely a scheme of the devil. And I'll tell you what it is. It's not just a scheme to keep you quiet. To stop you from testifying. It's really a scheme to pull you away from God and to pull you on his side. He's not just trying to shut you down. That's one thing. He's trying to get you back on his side, back on his team. You'll see that in a minute. So John is seeing the vision, and actually chapter 13 really should be part of chapter 12. It continues on. The dragon it says in the end of chapter 12, that last verse, the dragon was so angry that he went after the woman who we said was the people of God that brought forth the Messiah. And then he also made, went to make war with the rest of her children. And who were those children? Those who keep the commandments of Jesus and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So what it's telling us is that during the dragon's time on earth now, the people who follow Jesus, he's trying to make war against us. And here's how he does it. It says the dragon, verse 1, stood on the stand of the seashore. Now if you remember in chapter 12 it said the devil has been thrown down, right? But it said, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Woe to the sea and those in them. The sea in the Old Testament was the imagery of where evil emerged. Starting in the book of Genesis, right before creation, the world was covered with water, right? The seas covered the earth, and there was chaos. It said, and God shaped and made the earth out of that. And then in the book of Job, we see places where Leviathan and these sea creatures rise up and they're images of evil. And so it says the dragon is standing on the shore of the sea in this image and up from the water comes this beast, this monster. Why is it a beast, Pastor? Well, let me remind you from last week we said this is apocalyptic literature. This is a certain kind of literature. You're like, what does that even mean? Okay, I'll explain it this way. You ever go to see a movie? You go to see a, a thriller, right? Well, what do you expect when you're watching a thriller? You don't expect too many laughs, right? You might expect it to be a slow build. The plot is building. You're wondering what's going to happen. And then there's this climax there's this twist and it scares you but it's different right because it's not a horror movie it's not filled with gore and all kinds of blood and all kinds of crazy violence but it's like this thriller to get you on edge and then there's the resolution to that tension that's a thriller that's different than a comedy right a comedy starts out with laughs right at the beginning or a true, a true narrative or a true story that's a biopic. It's something that's talking about someone's life, trying to be as true to the events as possible. Well, here's a certain kind of literature. And in this kind of literature, it had its own types of structures and characters. And so what we have here is we have, from the perspective of God, the dragon brings forth this beast, this ugly monster. And to God, authorities that persecute his people are ugly monsters. It's a beast. 
Then I saw the beast coming up out of the sea, and it had ten horns. The number ten is often a reference to completion. And seven heads. Remember, the beast had seven horns and ten heads in chapter 12. And out of its horns were ten crowns. And on its heads were blasphemous names. Now, if I was someone who first got this letter, and I was maybe in the church of Philadelphia in the first century, I would be like, hmm. You know, Caesar, where I live here in Rome, has been setting up temples. And in those temples, they require emperor worship. And there was a point early in the first century when Caesar started to call himself the Son of God. And you can find ancient coins where it says Caesar, Son of God on them. But this was a common thing, and this was something that each local major city had, temples set up to the emperor, where people like, like you and me would go and put some incense toward the emperor's idol. And if you didn't do that, there were consequences. But this just started to happen. You see, when authorities, when governments and when states which is what the crowns and the horns likely refer to. When states take authority from God and when they assume worship that only is due God, they are ugly beasts. They are ugly monsters. The ultimate expression of the church's enemy is the satanically inspired worldly authorities. That's what this is talking about. And it says, And the beast had on its head blasphemous names. Caesar's no son of God. Caesar's not divine. And it says, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Remember, this is an image, a vision. And its feet were like those of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. What's all that lion leopard stuff? It's not the Brookfield Zoo, I'll tell you that. If you were to look in Daniel chapter 7, 66% of the book of Revelation is drawing allusions from the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel saw a dream as well. He saw four beasts. He saw a lion. He saw a bear. He saw a leopard. And he saw the last beast, which was a huge statue with ten toes. Scholars will tell you these are likely the four major empires of the world, the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. But what John is doing here, he's taking that image and he's putting it into a new form. And he's saying, look, he's saying, there will be authorities, especially to the first century church. There are authorities that are rising up even now who are going to steal, try to steal from God worship. And they're going to want you to give your worship to them and not God. And so he's saying this about that he's saying that's from the dragon the beast comes from the dragon comes from the devil any state any authority that is trying to force christians to deny their faith or force them to worship anything that's not god is a scheme of the devil you got to recognize it. It's not obvious sometimes. It's subtle. It comes in that gentle, disciplinary form like the gentleman did who, the fire chief. Well, you know, what you wrote, just 
it isn't helpful for the rest of the staff. Later, the mayor said, you know what? They lost confidence in your leadership. You know what? That fire chief sued and won the case against the city of Atlanta for that. Because they determined that now the mayor had it out for him from the beginning, and it was because of his religious views. That doesn't always happen. But don't forget that this is out there. In one country, this is in the last couple years, okay? So you're like, well, where is this happening? In other countries. One country, a law was put forth, and here's where some of, here were some of the, res the results. All crosses are to be dismantled from churches. Churches who are not on the official state list of sanctioned churches are to be destroyed. And you can go on YouTube and watch the videos. Some churches which had the Ten Commandments right behind them, those were replaced with quotes from the president. One pastor said this, and this pastor was on the list of churches that were allowed to have worship services. Without the permission of the authorities, you cannot organize a Bible study. And if you do get permission, you better hold it on a government approved religious, at a government-approved religious venue, at a government-approved time, with a government-approved leader, using the new government-approved Bible, which contains quotations from other religions and from the president himself. Then he said this, the goal of that government is to become God. And he said this, this is what the devil has always done. He nailed it. He nailed it. This isn't just this crazy leader. This is what the devil has always done. Trying to steal Worship from God. What did he do to the Jews? He tempted them with the pagan nations around them. Steal them away. Come worship these idols. Even Lot, right? Or Abraham. And when Abraham was, went up, excuse me, when Moses went up to the mountain, what happened? When he came down, what were they worshiping? A golden calf. And who made the calf? Aaron. Well, they told me to do it. Aaron, bro. Come on. Listen. This has always been his plan. You need to see it. You need to recognize it. The New Testament says we are not unaware of his schemes, right? That's the first step. Now here's number two. How do I respond when I'm pressured to abandon soul worship of God? By resisting even when the whole world gives in. What are you talking about, Pastor? Are you talking about protesting? Are you talking about breaking? Hold up. Let's look at the text. I saw one of his heads, so he's still in the image. He's seeing this beast with multiple heads, crowns on them. I saw one of its heads as if it had been slain. So one head was killed, and the fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. 
and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Stay with me. Anybody still with me? You need to resist temptations and pressure to abandon soul worship of God, soul worship of Jesus, even if the whole world goes after it. So there's this beast, and one of the heads is killed. Wow, that's a good thing. But then it's healed. What's that talking about? It's likely talking about in history or just kind of in their context. They had a, some crazy empire emperors. Anybody ever heard of Nero? Nero was not your friendly neighbor. He wasn't eating ice cream. Like sometimes the presidents are eating ice cream. No, 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 that's not Nero. Nero killed his own mom. And he was so paranoid he killed everybody around him. And then he died suddenly. And the people thought, man, you know what? Even though he's dead, is he really dead? Is he going to come back? And there was this idea that Nero was going to come back. Well, he didn't come back. But in a sense, he came back because Domitian, who was another emperor later, did the worst persecution of Christians there was during the Roman Empire. But Nero was brutal. To light up his gardens at night, he tarred Christians and lit them on fire. Domitian did, did the same. Worldwide persecution, the Roman Empire. So there was this idea that sometimes these crazy beasts, these leaders who ask for worship, they're taken out, but then somehow it just comes up again. And then the Roman Empire is gone by 400 A.D., the middle of the 400s, and yet we still have crazy people like Adolf Hitler, like other leaders of other countries demanding worship, calling themselves God. keeps coming back. But it's really not about the beast. It's really not about that ruler. It's about the dragon. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. So they give their allegiance to state governments because they're pressured to. But what they don't know is they're really giving it to the devil. And people will exclaim, man, the power that some of these governments have, who is like them, who is able to wage war with them. You know what? That is a, a parody, verse 5, verse 4 there. It's a parody because remember in chapter 5, this was, we did this a couple years ago, but it says there's this scroll. And on the scroll there are seven seals, and they're like, who is worthy to open the scroll? And they say there's the Lamb, Jesus is the only one worthy. So Satan brings forth his form, his Messiah, and he says, let me put forth these powerful earthly leaders who will even demand worship from people, and people will go after them. And people will exclaim, man, who was so powerful like them? But Satan falls short. He's a fake Verse 5, there was a mouth given to him to speak arrogant words. Once again, this is a reference to Daniel. The beast will exalt himself over God and against the church until Jesus returns. It says he was given these authority to act for 42 months. Remember we mentioned this before, the 42 months. That's the same amount of time as three and a half years. That's the same amount of time as 1,260 days. So we've seen those references last week. If you're not familiar, please listen to last week's message. But what it is is this. When Jesus is caught up to the throne in chapter 12, it says that 
The dragon was allowed authority for 1260 days. But God protected the believers in the wilderness, and he also protects the children coming from the woman who are also believers who will come after them during that duration of time. It's likely a reference to the church age, the time we're in now between Jesus' first coming and his death and resurrection until he returns. He's saying, look, the dragon has time, not in heaven but on earth, to deceive others and to wage war of the, against Christians. One man named August Landmesser. You've probably never heard that name either. He was a German factory worker whose story has since gone viral, but it took about 30, 40 years to go viral. Adolf Hitler was visiting his factory where he worked. And Mr. Landmesser was someone who did not like the policies of the Nazi party. Now, this was before 1940, so Hitler was still rising up. But he had a hostility towards the Jews. So Hitler came to his factory, and everybody lined up. And when Hitler came out, there was this great noise, and everybody put their hand up and saluted him. I have a picture of it. Everyone but one dude. You see him? Everyone saluted that beast except for one guy. You know why he didn't do it? Because he was in love with a Jewish woman. And Hitler was after the Jews, amongst others. He was, he was reprimanded. He was disgraced because later this picture was put on a newspaper. He wouldn't salute because of his love. Now listen to this. You don't give your allegiance to anyone else because you love Jesus. Don't you ever give your allegiance or worship to anyone but God. Just like him. You fold your arms. Someone tells you to pray in the name of another God. You say, I will not do that. Then I won't pray. Remember Pastor Mark, our senior pastor, they told him, hey, Pastor, can you pray at this graduation? It was this huge graduation. graduation, And they said, but you know what, we just want you to just pray, you know, like, don't pray in any specific religious names or any deities or anything. And so he prayed really generally, right? And then he was asked to close in prayer. He felt convicted. He said he felt convicted. And when he got up to pray, he said, you know what, I pray in only one name. There's only one person that I know that I can pray in their name, and that's Jesus. And he prayed in the name of Jesus. You do that. Someone says, tone it down. If you're doing the right thing, if God's leading you, don't tone it down. That's probably just the enemy trying to silence you. Now here's number three. What do I do when I'm pressured to abandon God, to abandon worship of God? By enduring difficulty as a result of refusing to trade in true worship for that which is false. We are ones who will refuse to worship anyone but the God of the Bible. 
7 through 10. Now let me just back up. I can't miss this because last week I, I was like, oh, I missed that verse. Look at verse 6. The beast opened his mouth in blasphemies against God. That likely means that he's claiming deity. Not only against God, but to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. Well, what do you mean his tabernacle? There is no tabernacle. There's no temple. Look what it says. That is those who dwell in heaven. That's us. Our citizenship is in heaven, right? But everybody else who follows after the beast in the book of Revelation, without exception, is called those who dwell on the earth. So if you're a believer in Christ, God says you're somebody who, your citizenship, your name is in heaven. But listen, the beast may slander you. Authorities may discredit you and give some fake reason why you were terminated, why you were let go, or why you were disciplined or reprimanded. That's just the way the beast is. And point three is to say, we have to endure it, okay? This isn't the easy, this isn't the easy uh, prosperity gospel component here. Sorry, this ain't coming. But listen, we need to let the word of God fall as it does into our ears. We need to endure difficulty because we won't trade in our true worship. It was also given to the beast to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Now that's just another parody. Remember, a couple years ago we went through when Jesus is worshipped, there's what? People worshipping in heaven from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Here the beast steals worship on earth, worship that's due to God alone. He steals it from everyone, every person, tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Now here's our verse. All who dwell on the earth, that's talking about those who are not citizens of heaven, those who are not believers, all, all who dwell on the earth will worship the beast, everyone whose name has not been written in the from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This is the perseverance of the saints. Who's still with me? Okay, hear me out here. He's getting to a point, right? He showed us images. Authorities assuming place and power that's not theirs, that's only God's. They're ugly beasts to God. But they come from the devil. They're after Christians, okay? I know it's scary. It's like, wow, that's really scary. I don't know if I want to be a Christian. Listen, if you already won, you signed up. You already said goodbye to the devil. But don't worry, I have a, a couple things to give you some strength. But he's been given the authority to make war with us and in some cases overcome us. There are people who, because of their faith in Jesus, lost their jobs. There's people who, because of their faith in Jesus in other countries and even in this country, who've been killed because they believe in Jesus Christ. Not everyone will be martyred, but some have. And he's been given authority over everybody, not, not every single person, but every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, over all regions, all kinds of people. And they go after him, and they worship him. But then he says this, but the authority stops in verse 8. Those whose name was not written in the book of life. So if your name is written in the book of life, he can't touch you. He can't touch you eternally. 
Your eternity is secure. Your citizenship is locked in in heaven. There is difficulty, though, because he's going to say that. And here's what he says, because that name is tied to the lamb who has been slain before the foundation of the world. Wait, what? Yeah, that's right. Your mind got it right. Jesus was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. Jesus was the plan to be on that cross before anybody was on this earth. This is all God's plan, even the beast. Even the beast. It says it was given to him to have authority. Somehow in, the, in our good God's plan, difficulties draw us closer to him. Difficulties cause us to persevere. We're tested, but when we're tested and we pass, we're approved. Remember the hour of trial that is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, to test if they're genuine or not. Here's what someone said. Christians are to obey. See, this is the funny thing because if you know Romans, Romans 13 says obey your governing authorities, right? We've talked about this. We talked about this when we talked about honor your father and mother. We talked about authority. We talked about speed limits, the ambulance going by, we pull over. God wants us to obey authority because authority has been given by God. But when authority oversteps its bounds and becomes like the devil wants, that's where they've crossed the line. And that's where if they ask us to do anything that's unbiblical, we don't listen. Christians are to obey the government because it was ordained by God. But when the government oversteps its bounds and demands religious worship of itself, then Christians are not to submit, but they are to submit to the difficulties that the government decrees for their noncompliance. That's what verse 10 says. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Let me say this. Not everybody has spiritual ears. Not everybody has spiritual ears. Do you agree with that? Even some people in this room, spiritually, a message is going forth. It's going right over your head. We have to tune in. We have to rely upon God to give us spiritual ears. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is an important thing he's going to say right here. And he says, if anyone is destined to go to captivity, like some people are going to face prison. It's happening in other parts of the world. If anyone is going to be killed for their faith, he will be killed. This is the perseverance of the saints. This is what we must endure. But when we persevere under these difficult times, we show ourselves to be genuine followers of Jesus. If you don't get anything about beasts, monsters, and dragons, get this. Jesus wants you to stay faithful through hard times, through pressures by people who want you to deny Christ and follow after something else. Yesterday, some of us were at Feed My Starving Children. That was an amazing time. Thank you to Alicia for organizing that. There was a, a brother with us. He was from Kurdistan. I don't know if you saw him. He had a, like a gray hat on. He came with Adam and Leanne. I was talking with him afterwards. Kurdistan is, it borders China. It also borders Muslim countries on the south and west of it. it. used to be part of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union fell, it became its own country, ruled by communism. When he was talking, I thought, wow, everything he's saying is about Revelation 13. He said the communists thoroughly rule the country, and in many ways there's like a Muslim takeover. And it's not just 
any common Muslim um, beliefs. It is a very strict, like he said, some people, they come to your door and they knock on your door and they say, hey, you're coming to the mosque today. And if you don't, they get really angry with you, angry with you and they beat you. They pressure you. He said he grew up Muslim, his dad was Muslim, and there was a point where he ran into some Christians who were doing a worship service. And he could tell, he said, you know, the way they talked about God, I could feel that there was something different about the way they were talking about him. It was like something that came from here. It was something true. It was a pure worship about them. It was different. And that attracted him and that attracted his mother to the gospel, and eventually he became a believer. But he said, you know what, after I became a believer and his friends found out about it, they came to his house and said, you know, you broke Sharia law and we're supposed to kill you. They told him that. Well, he's like, well, obviously I'm here today, so he said they, they kind of let him go. But as he prayed, as he went through, he went through some really challenging times. He eventually came here. He lives in Seattle. He came here with his wife, two kids, and they had one more kid while they were in the United States. He said, but Christians there, they face all kinds of challenges. They don't get promoted on the job. They get let go. They get uh, avoided. They feel like they're being watched because they're not where they're supposed to be on the holy day. He said it was a blessing for him to come here. You're like, well, why would he want to come here? Our country's all jacked up. Listen, you want to go somewhere else? Trust me, you do not. God made a way for him to get here. Yeah, we have our issues. We have things we have to work through. But there are people whose lives are at stake every day. They can't walk into a store, and if they don't say the Muslim greeting, they're not allowed to buy or sell anything. They don't have people knocking on their door telling them, let's go to mosque. And if they don't refuse, they got to, what, dart out the door and escape being beat? We complain when people are driving slow in front of us. I was doing it yesterday. I was late to the feed my starving children. As we get ready to close, I want to encourage you. You're like, whoa, this is just not for me. I'm not coming next week. Three try challenge is over. (laughs) You know what? I want to ask you this. Did I faithfully proclaim the word today? Examine it. (laughs) Jesus told us as well, in this world you will have trouble. You know why he told us? Because he didn't want us to be surprised and then shocked and then fall away as a result. That's why. John 14. He's like, hey, I'm going to leave you guys, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit of Jesus, to be with you forever. But I don't want you to be shocked because they're going to take me. They're going to arrest me, put me on a cross. I'm going to get a fake trial. I'm going to be falsely accused. I'm going to rise again. But I don't want you to fall away. Peter, James, John, the other disciples. But here's what we have. You're not in it alone. You're not in it alone. There's other believers here. There's other believers here for you to rely upon. Your group leader, leaders in the church, me, maybe someone you're going to meet later today, someone you talk to. You need other people because if you get dismissed or if you get reprimanded at work for something, 
or wearing a shirt that says has a cross on it or something, you may need to be encouraged. You may not face knocking on the door and martyrdom. We probably won't face that, but listen, we will face challenges as we live out our Christian faith. You have prayer, you have the Holy Spirit. And also, you have an eternal focus. That's probably the first thing. We have to focus where our citizenship is, which is in heaven. We focus there first. Let me close with this story. I'm sorry I go long here. Someone I know recently was on a group text. And they were texting about all kinds of things going on in the world. And this person texted, you know what, I hope that through these difficulties, people can find hope in Jesus Christ. And a friend that she had for 14 years sent a message back and said, wow, I thought I knew that person, but I guess I don't anymore. And she lost a friend just like that from a text. And that wasn't the first thing that happened to her. Because that text was a group text and other neighbors started to kind of avoid her. All because she put a little Bible verse on a group text. But that's hard. That's that's not it may not be prison, it may not be things like that, but it can be a challenge. So we need to strengthen one another. We need to share with someone else if you've gone through something like something like that so you can be strengthened to keep going. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, God, which challenges us to not give in to the temptation and pressure to abandon your worship, even if the state tells us to, Lord. States overstep their bounds. But there's one God and one God that we serve. It's you, O oh Lord, and your Son, Jesus Christ. Anyone here who has not put their faith in Jesus Christ, we ask you today, God, that you would open their hearts and minds to desire to be made new by him. Give them a heart that turns away from sin and give her a heart that turns to Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please stand. Let's worship the Lamb who was slain.
Just let that soak in. You are a child of God. You're not a slave to fear. You can be bold. You can be a witness for Jesus. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you, the Spirit of truth, Just a reminder, if you're going to go with us to the outreach, you can just make your way up here eventually. We'll do a little brief training and prayer. Pray for us, too, us who are going. If you're not going, just pray for us. Um, Pray for those hearts that we're going to talk to. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name.